It's a family affair with Seth Haverkamp. His four children and wife are his continuous subjects that celebrate the portrait as art. Seth's passion for uniqueness and mystery, emotion and drama are the result of playful sessions with his children. Seth strives to capture a timeless moment with meaningful themes. Themes such as innocence and peace, sweetness and confidence, self-reflection, or the use of props, such as a headdress of blossoming twigs to represent growth. Seth's portrait style is realism with abstract backgrounds, whimsical imaginative subjects, and luminous strong color that lures the viewer in with mystery. Seth is an internationally acclaimed artist, having won many prestigious awards, of which the most recent was the Portrait Society of America's grand prize. Seth is truly an East Tennessee gem. Hello, I am Seth Haverkamp. I am a uh, full-time artist who lives in Norris, Tennessee, and I do strictly realism for the most part. Um, I do a lot of commissions and a lot of studio work that goes to galleries, uh, mostly portraits, but I also do quite a bit of still life and figurative work. And I've been painting full-time since 2013, and what I do? <laughs> so behind me I have two paintings that um, uh, this one I just finished recently and that one I just started. Uh, this painting um, I think is pretty interesting um, just because it's so much different and um, it came about from a photo shoot we did um, on the beach around Christmas time. And I was with uh, my kids and my and their cousins, and I brought out my flash. I did the whole the whole thing, and the kids were like, "Can we throw sand?" I was like, "No." And I was like, "Well, actually, yeah, go ahead, throw sand." So literally, what this was was a product of taking like a hundred pictures, and um, this is my daughter who is who is a born actor, and she was being like a queen or something. Who knows what she was doing? Uh, and then the other kids are below, and they were literally throwing sand, and it was one of those just pure luck moments that I, that I captured this moment um, with the sand just arcing just right, the light bouncing off the sand, hitting her arm. It literally missed her eyes as it went across. Just I, like I saw the photo, I was like, this is <laughs> like too good to be true. Um, and I knew I was gonna paint it at some point. So what was, what was different, what was difficult was, is that I painted the face fully, like fully rendered, finished face. Um, and then I obliterated it with throwing paint on top of it, um, which uh, took a little, bit of, a little bit of courage, but I was happy to do it. And I think, um, you know, created a sort of unique, interesting image um, that, uh, that oddly enough, I won't get into the story because it's really personal to her, but it is a very personal to her painting. Like it really symbolizes who she is. The name is Split Infinity. I'll just leave it at that. And so what we have here is um, another daughter of mine, my younger daughter. Um, and this is two days into the process. Uh, and you can see kind of how free and loose it is as, you know, loose, 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 loose to, you know, starting to get tight and controlled as we move up to the face. And um, I really try to um, keep paintings as loose as I can, as long as I can, and, and let the drawing just kind of develop as I go. Um, I will never uh, spend eight hours at a easel just working on the drawing. Um, and, and before I move on, I mean, I like to have fun when I paint. So I like to, um, be really loose and free. And, uh, when you see the demo I do, I think I'll, hopefully that'll come across as to what I actually mean. Um, but this painting as tight as, as, 
as tight and controlled as it is started the same way really loose and free and then through the course of like two months of doing a lot of layers it, it gets really uh, tight and controlled um, but i do zoom into the eyes pretty quickly uh, they really are definitely the focus point of any portrait and they also help me establish what needs to go where so once i get one eye developed um, i then know exactly where the other eye needs to be and I can then push the nose down to wherever it needs to be and just uh, expand from there. Also, I started to just introduce a few colors on the second stage that I will push um, much more as I go. And it'll become, I mean, I don't know where this painting is going yet, but there'll be a lot of colors uh, in the face. Um, and true to form, this has the warm light from this side and the cool light kind of from above. Um, that'll be fun to uh, push and um, you know, really push the oranges and the reds and the warms and the purples and the blues and the in the cool side. Um, that's something I just really enjoy doing. Uh, some things I really like to focus on when I'm doing um, that are really important to me in the portrait is the is the face. Obviously, um, you know, we want the likeness to be good. Um, Although likeness isn't my number one goal, <laughs> I guess I'll say that. Unless it's a commission, of course, it needs to look just like the person. Uh, but I oftentimes exaggerate a little bit, push things out a little bit, you know, whatever to to do what I think is is um, just maybe more, even more unique than the individual, if if that makes any sense whatsoever. Meaning, if the painting is going along well, even though the likeness isn't perfect, I'll keep going with the painting um, and not try to make the likeness perfect. Um, if it's not a commission, <laughs> if it is a commission, the likeness has to be right, of course. Um, and so I really try to do, you know, the fully realized face, um, as well as the hands. I think the hands are also incredibly important. So just talking about hands, um, I don't think you can have a complete portrait without hands and the hands, the gesture of the hands. Uh, hands are just as unique as faces and the length of the fingers, uh, you know, the witheredness or the not witheredness as the case may be of the hand, uh, I think is really interesting and how a person is using their hands and what, what gestures they're making or what they're doing with their hands is all, um, just, I think really important and really fun to put into a portrait. And I also just enjoy painting hands. I like how detailed they are and how you can um, really uh, spend a lot of time with a tiny brush really developing um, you know, intricate little fingers. And so that's, uh, that's really uh, important to me to get the hands in there well. Um, so what I want to discuss next is just a little bit of how I achieve the look I achieve in the portraits. Um, and that's through the use of uh, color. Um, I use very few colors on my palette, which we'll go over when I demo, but it'll, um, but it's basically bright red, bright yellow, bright blue, and bright purple, <laughs> and orange, cadmium orange. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And um, I like to use less color mixing and more pure color the right value of that pure color, meaning white, and overlap these intense colors to get sort of a, a unique look. I paint with the concept that cool colors recede. So instead of just using a darker flesh color, whatever that may mean, as the as a shape rolls out, I'll actually use blue or green or purple um, to get that feeling of the form receding and put it in really brightly. Um, and then when that's dry, I'll scumble uh, different colors on top of that to downplay the blue or, you know, to um, mix, mix it. Uh, mix it's not the right word because it's dry, but, um, you know, model maybe is a better word. Model the uh, forms. And noses are really fun and my favorite thing to paint because there's so, you know, it's just such a quick, there's so many quick changes. You know, the nose just changes instantly. And every little facet of that nose can literally be a different color, um, which is just really fun. And not only can it be a different color, but it can also be an, a different pure color with white uh, to, um, to get that feeling of that three dimensional nose, like it's really coming off the page um, and to really start sculpting these forms uh which we'll discuss a little during the demo as well and then there's thick and thin paint you know there's a lot of thick paint where um 
where the highlights are, where you're literally sculpting it. You know, it's, it's, you look at a quarter and George Washington's face or whoever it is is bouncing off the quarter. Why? Because it's sculpted. Same thing with painting. We want all this light that's in the room to bounce off that thick paint where the highlights are and to, to help give a three dimensional look. So thick to thin paint, warm to cool colors, beautifully modeled, beautiful transitions, but not blended, um, can really give a nice, unique, uh, unique look in a very three-dimensional portrait or image or anything, hand, leg, um, you know, glass jar, whatever it may be. So, um, so I need to discuss backgrounds a little. Uh, my backgrounds are, um, I've heard the word thrown around as unique. I don't know. I don't want to say my pack backgrounds are unique, but that's what people say. <laughs> um, it's really just a watercolor effect, but with oils. Uh, but they started a number of years ago when I realized that I really enjoyed painting portraits, but I did not enjoy painting backgrounds. And so I looked around my studio and I had all these unfinished paintings because there was, the backgrounds weren't finished. Um, and I just had very little interest in painting space and stuff at the time. Uh, and um, whenever I tried to fill in the space without doing that, it looked like, you know, an uh, elementary school picture or something or just bad, basically. And I, was I, ended, up, I ended up ruining paintings that were going along, coming along pretty well because I didn't know what to do with the background. So I was working on a really big portrait of... I think it was my wife actually at the time. And then I was working on the background and I was having a very bad day. <laughs> and it was not going well. And I think I was ready to destroy the painting. And I, I think, I, well, I almost did. I picked the painting up, I literally threw it on the ground and I took a big brush and I just, I dipped it in turp and I just slammed it on the, I just splashed it on the painting and um, paint and, and turpinoid went everywhere and, and I stormed out of the studio. I threw the brush down, I stormed out of the studio, turned off the lights, closed the door and left. So uh, after a great night's sleep, I came back the next day and turned on the lights and walked up to the painting and I was like, ah, this is so cool. It was, um, it was, it was awesome. It was a really awesome thing. There were just these, the, the turp, because I had the paint on the background, the turp where it hit just spread out and created this really interesting bubbling and, and it showed the painting from underneath. Um, and it, it just, it was like an aha moment. Like, you know, there's something here. I can do something with this. And for that particular painting, it literally finished the painting. It was really just pure luck that, that this happened. Um, so that was in 2009 ish. So from then I've been experimenting with how to develop this, this splatter technique and the splatter approach, um, to, uh, uh, finish my paintings. Um, so it's pure, it's pretty darn abstract. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't turn a painting into an abstract painting because we have a lot to focus on there because the portrait, but I think it, it fills the space. Well, it allows you to go in there and, you know, look at it closely if you'd like to kind of draws you in, but at the same time, they're not too overpowering, hopefully to where it distracts from the face. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just built up from many layers of paint where I do glazes and then splash other colors in there, splash just turp in there and, and build it up. And um, I've done paintings where there's, you know, 15 to 20 layers of paint uh, on the backgrounds. And um, so this is a, you know, pretty decent example. Um, it's kind of Milky Way-ish. Uh, it's really fun to, you know, paint the night sky with this uh, technique. And um, one thing that makes it work though is in the face, it's all these bright colors um, that get toned down through layers and same thing with the background. So every layer is a, is a bright, pure layer, uh, but because it's a glaze, um, you know, the other layers show through and it kind of, you know, it, it tones itself down, but it, it stays connected because you, I'm using the same exact colors here that I'm using here. So it's been a really uh, fun. Uh, I love painting my backgrounds. It's been fun. Um, and a, I guess unique way to finish uh, portraits. One thing that is uh, interesting um, is I am colorblind. I am red, green, colorblind. Um, hard to describe what I see because I don't really know. Um, 
it it takes uh, I think it's mostly green that I have trouble with, um, <clears throat> and especially for things that aren't like green but like kind of green ish. Um, uh, so things like kind of a middle value green, a middle value purple, middle value gray, even the middle value blue um, can all look like I can't differentiate them. Um, they all look similar and they all could be described as gray, basically. People think that's one reason I paint the way I paint, which is, which is probably true. Um, I spent a lot of, in college, I painted a lot of green people and I didn't know I was painting green people. Um, and I got really tired of painting green people. And so as a result of that, I mixed less and I used more pure color because I can see cadmium orange and cadmium yellow. When you mix with white, it's still orange with white. Um, I can see purple and blue um, and permanent rose is, I just know it's permanent rose. Um, so I, I came up with this layering uh, bright colors um, as opposed to over mixing because I don't know what the result is. I don't know when I have green on my palette. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, but because of that, I follow these principles um, that make a painting work. You know, how do you make something round? Well, cool colors recede, warm colors come forward, um, as an example. And so I don't care that this is a particular shade of greenish flesh or whatever. I, I don't even know what that means, but apparently there's a lot of green in faces. I don't know. <laughs> um, that I don't care. I don't focus on that. I focus on, do I see a hint of cool back there? And if I do, I'm just going to push to cool. And that could often mean me just digging into my blue, mixing the right value of that blue, which means probably using white and putting that up there as opposed to going about and trying to spend five minutes mixing the correct color because I know I can't. I just can't do it because I don't know what I'm seeing. Um, so I, I, um, I just push the warms and cools um, and uh, try to get the value right um, in order to get my paintings to, um, to work. <laughs>